Well, this morning I'd like you to turn to the prophet Malachi. That's page 960. The prophet Malachi. It's 960 in the chapel Bibles here. It's that part of the Bible that is not thumbed very much. You see, it's very clean just there. Do you notice it in your Bible? The Psalms are quite heavily marked. The New Testament's heavily grubby, but the minor prophets are clean, aren't they? I wonder why that is. Now, if you know your Bible, you... Well, that's very interesting. I wonder what you expect coming from the prophet Malachi. I want to read from Malachi chapter 1 in verse 6 to chapter 2 and verse 9. It's a fairly long reading for me on a Wednesday morning here, but I think it, the context here is very important. So I'm going to read then Malachi chapter 1 and verse 6. A son honors his father. Oh, let me just say this. We are in the days of the old covenant, therefore we're talking about temples, priests, sacrifices and all that, Okay. We're talking about the Jews in Jerusalem in the temple. And it's God speaking, right. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due to me? If I am a master, where is the respect due to me? Says the Lord Almighty. It is you, O priests, who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? You taste defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible when you bring blind animals for sacrifice. Is that not wrong? When you sacrifice crippled or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Now implore God to be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hands, will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors, so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations or the Gentiles. From the rising to the setting of the sun, in every place incense and pure offerings will be brought to my name, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. That is a tremendous prophecy of the gospel. But you, going back to the Jews in that time, you profane it by saying of the Lord's table, it is defiled, and of its food it is contemptible. And you say, what a burden. And you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, crippled, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations." I'll just go on a few more verses. And now this admonition is for you, O priests. If you do not listen, and if you do not set your heart to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them, because you have not set your heart to honor me. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will spread on your faces the offal from your festival sacrifices and you will be carried off with it and you will know that I have sent you this admonition so that my covenant with Levi may continue says the Lord Almighty my covenant was with him a covenant of life and peace and I gave them to him this call for reverence and he revered me and stood in awe of my name True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and turned many from sin. For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge, and from his mouth men should seek instruction, because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty. But you have turned from the way, and by your teaching have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. 
So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people because you have not followed my ways but have shown partiality in the matters of the law. Just before we started, people were asking me, talking about, did I have some good news today? And I had to say, well, uh, but, but it is good news, of course, because it's, uh, I hope it's scripture. That's good news. But I know what this person meant, and the answer was no. I'm afraid not. Uh, I don't come uh, this morning sort of leaping for joy. Um, uh, It'd be lovely if I was coming to preach on a text, something like, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. There's plenty of texts like that. and Or comforting words, cast all your burden upon the Lord, for he cares for you. Rest in the Lord and such things. But you know... Preachers, if they are real preachers, can't just hop about for all the pleasant texts in the Bible. We have to discharge a responsibility before God. Now, I think you would agree, I think it's fair to say that on these Wednesday mornings, I recognize it's a short service, just for a few of us of a certain age gathered together to hear the Word of God uh, for a few minutes and have fellowship together. But I think you'll agree with me that I have tried to give you 16 ounces in the pound when I've come here. I don't pull any punches. I've tried to give you weighty material, but it's weighty this morning. My text is Malachi chapter 1 and verse 10. That's my text. I guess the answer to this question, I think I can guess the answer, but does anybody here remember they've ever heard a discourse on this verse? Anybody? Malachi verse chapter 1 verse 10. I've never preached on it. I've never heard anybody preach on it. I looked at Mr. Spurgeon and he didn't preach on it. Have you? No, nobody said it. No. I wonder why. You don't hear many sermons on Malachi, do you? (laughs) Malachi is the last uh, prophet in the Old Testament. Don't look at it. How does Malachi close his prophecy? Prophecy. Well, the last word he says is curse. Why is that important? There's a gap between Malachi and Matthew. I know there's not in your Bible, but there is. There's a long gap between Malachi and Matthew, 400 years in fact. And God gave Israel no prophet for 400 years. Until John the Baptist came, they had no further word from God. So the last time God spoke to this people at Little Stoughton was in 1620, okay? An awful lot of people in Little Stoughton have died between 1620 and 2016 and never heard a word from God, except the last one. Curse. I think we're getting the message. I think we know why we don't go to Malachi very much. Now, my text is Malachi 1, verse 10. Now, this is very interesting. Some of you have got the King James Version there, the authorized version. And your version is quite different to my text. It's very different. My text says, Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar, and so on. Oh, that somebody would shut the doors. That's what God is saying to these Jews in Jerusalem at this time. But your version, the King James Version, the authorized version, has Atma. It's it's got a different version. It's there. It says something along the lines, God is complaining that the priests will not shut the doors for naught. You've got the words for naught at the end. But if you look at the printing in your Bible, there's something interesting about those words. What's interesting about them? They're in italics. They're in italics, yeah. That means not that they're emphatic, 
We use italics to be emphasis, stress, but that's not in the Bible. Italics in the Bible means something very different. What does it mean? It means... Not sure. It's, eh, not sure, it's not, but it's, it's been added. The translators coming out of the Hebrew here thought that they would make it easier for you to understand or take a certain line of understanding and they introduced the idea of for naught. In other words, they made the text read like this, that Malachi or God through Malachi is complaining to the priests that they will not do their work, they will not shut the doors, they will not sacrifice unless they get paid for it. That's what Malachi is saying. That's what the authorized version makes us understand. That the priests were not doing it unless they got money for it. Now, the authorized version is unique in this translation. Those words should never have been put in there. I won't digress, we haven't got time this morning, but I think I could tell you why they're put in there, but uh, I won't go into that. But those words should not be put in there. It misleads you quite badly. Malachi, or God in the name of Malachi, is not complaining about the priests because they will not do their work unless they get paid. God in the Old Covenant raised up men to do that. He raised up priests under Levi, Aaron and all the rest. He raised up these priests and they had to be paid. God is very strong about it. They must be paid to do their work. They do it on behalf of Judah and they must do their work. And so the Jews are not actually worshipping, they're not actually sacrificing, they've delegated it to these priests. And the priests must faithfully do it, morning and evening and all the rest of it. That was the old covenant, they were sacrificing priests. The long words are sacramentalists and sacerdotalists. They were offering pre uh, sacrifices in the name and behalf on the behalf of the people. But when we come over into the new covenant under Jesus Christ, all that is gone. Because Christ is the priest now. We don't have any temples now in buildings. This building here is nothing to do with the temple. This is just a convenient place to sit. I'm not despising the building, but it's just a convenient building, that's all. The temple in the New Testament is what? It's the individual believer. The temple in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, is the gathering of the believers. Together we form a temple of the Holy Spirit. The priests in the New Testament, the great high priest is Jesus Christ. The priests in the New Testament are every believer. Every believer is a sacrificing priest, not um, animals and that, but we offer spiritual sacrifices. What we're doing this morning, God regards as a spiritual sacrifice. Preaching his word, hearing his word, praising him, serving him, having fellowship together, talking to each other about things of the spirit. These are things that please God in the new covenant. Unfortunately, some men called the fathers... You may have heard of them, like people like Augustine and Cyprian and other men, but these men, uh, one man in particular, a man called Cyprian, he went back to the Old Covenant and he drew the idea of the priest and he brought it into the New Covenant. And that's where we get this idea of clergy and reverend and pastors and all the rest of it, and laity, all that kind of stuff comes from the fathers. And the Church of England went back to the fathers, not scripture, they're quite open about it, they're a church based on the fathers, and they go back to the fathers and scripture, they say, but it's the fathers, and therefore that is why they are a priestly uh, church, that's why they are priests. We do not that, we do not, we reject that, that's utterly wrong. But the point is, Malachi is not complaining, God is not complaining that these men are not doing their job for money. That's not the complaint. Let me just illustrate this once more and I must get on. But I remember looking on, I saw on Look East many years ago now when I lived over in East Anglia, oh, must be 20, 30, 40 years ago. I remember seeing a, on the Look East program, the news program, you know, and it was a very clever bit of photography. They were doing a village, a series on a village, uh, and they had a lady at the sink, she was doing her dishes or washing up, nine o'clock in the morning. And this lady was doing the dishes there, and uh, the photograph was on her, and she was in sharp focus, and you could see slightly out of focus, you could see a window, and then completely out of focus, it was all fuzzy through the window. 
And she was talking, and she was saying, well, look, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a believer, I go to church, and that kind of thought. She said, but of course I can't be at the service now, I'm busy at the house. But it's nice to know that across the green, and then the camera went into focus, across the green, and you could see the Church of England over in the distance. It was nice to know that over there the minister was saying the morning service. And he was doing it for her, you see. He was praying for her. She couldn't pray, she didn't have time, but he was praying. Priestcraft. That's old covenant. And that priest should have been paid, you know, in the old covenant. And he was. That's not the complaint. So what is the complaint? It's nothing to do with that at all. This is what the text actually says. This is what God is actually saying. And the NIV is excellent here. All oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors. All oh, that one of you would stop these useless fires being lit on the altar. What God wants here, he's speaking as a man. What he's doing, he's crying out to these uh, Jews at this time. He's saying, look, I've had enough of what's going on there. I'm fed up to the back teeth with it, to be honest. And I want it stopped. In fact, he says, this is what God is saying. I would rather that the doors were shut than have this nonsense. Now, what nonsense? Well, that's why I read all those verses. You can read it again. Because what was happening was this. The Jews were offering to God second-rate sacrifices. They were corrupting the worship of God. If you read it again for yourself, you'll see that God complains. Chapter 2, verse 7. In the past, he says, when I raised up the Levites, they were faithful to my word. You are not faithful to my word now. You are corrupting my word. You are teaching nonsense in my name. And I'd rather have an empty pulpit, a closed temple, than hear what you're preaching and see what you're doing. This is what God is saying to them. This has happened before. You know now Malachi, you, you, you must remember, that Malachi is a prophet in the time after the exile. God had set up the temple under Solomon. And you have this tremendous prayer in the Kings, in the Samuel. You have tremendous prayers in the historical books. And, and in the beginning, all was glorious. But it soon corrupted. And you remember, they started bringing false idols into the temple. They started worshipping the sun. And all sorts of nonsense. And you know what God did. He took the nation into captivity. He took Israel, the northern kingdom, into Assyria, first of all. And then he took Judah, the southern kingdom, into captivity under Babylon. And they, the Babylonians destroyed the temple. Things had got so bad in Judah, in Jerusalem, that God would rather have the temple destroyed than have the corruption that was going on in his name. He did, in his mercy, bring them back as he prophesied. And they did again build the temple, Nehemiah and Ezra. And these prophets, Haggai, Malachi, and Zechariah, are raised up to preach during the days of that restoration. But if you read those prophets, you will see that things were quickly degenerating again, Malachi particularly here. And God was saying to them, look, you're going all over again, and if it carries on, well, I want you to stop it, but the implication is, if you don't stop it, I will put a stop to it once more. And he did. I've just explained. When Malachi gave his last word, which was curse, God sent no more prophet to them for 400 years. What did he send to them? He sent the Greeks to them. And what did they do? They utterly sacked the temple. And when you come to the New Testament, you find the Romans there. God is saying through this passage, 
to Israel, to Judah. If you don't do it, then I will do it. And he did it. If you know your history, you know that in AD 70, he utterly destroyed the temple. The Romans did. Well, that's the old covenant. That's history. <laughs> Is there anything like this in the New Testament? Anything like it at all? It's a much gentler book, isn't it? Much nicer book, isn't it? Much more pleasant than the New Testament. You think so? Then you don't know your Bible very well. How about Revelation 2 and 3? How about the Lord Jesus Christ there speaking to seven churches in, a in Asia Minor? What we would call Turkey today. Ephesus, Pergamon, Thyatira, Laodicea, Philadelphia, and so on. What does he say to those churches? Revelation 2 and 3. They were literal churches. They were real churches. They were in Asia Minor. Some of them were planted by Paul. They were apostolic churches. They, were, they believed the gospel. They were preaching the gospel. They were seeing sinners saved. What was Christ saying to them? You must remember John writes his revelation towards the end of the New Testament. It's about AD 90, 96. And what does he say to them? What does Christ say to the churches, these seven churches at that time? And nearly all of them, if you look at it, he has tremendous complaints about them. And what does he say? You remember what he says. Unless you repent... I'll spew you out of my mouth. I'll spew you out of my mouth. That's ladies here. I'll spew you out of my mouth. More pleasant? He also uses the illustration time and again, I will remove the candlestick. candlestick. It's a different illustration. It's not closing the doors, because there's no building to talk about now. But what he says is, I'll remove the light from the place. And it wasn't an idle threat, my friend. Christ never makes idle threats. Where are those churches today? Some of you have traveled to those parts. You can see the ruins of these cities. But where are the gospel churches, the gospel preaching places, in Smyrna, Philadelphia, Laodicea, and all the rest of it? They're gone. Indeed, where's the church of Rome? Where's the church of Ephesus? Where's the church of Philippi? In North Africa, Tunisia, uh, Algeria, all those places, Libya, in the years 200 and 300 and 400, that was a tremendous place for the gospel. I don't know if you know your church history, but there were... Tremendous blessings of the gospel in North Africa in the year 200 and 300. And it's wonderful stories of people who were martyred for Christ in those parts. I, I have been there and I have seen the baptizing pools where they plunged believers in North Africa, in Tunisia. I have seen the Colosseums, the amphitheaters. I've been down below there and I've seen the cages where they kept the Christians on one side and they kept the lions and the bears and the tigers on the other side. And they let the tigers out into the, into the arena to feed and fight and kill the believers. But all that's gone now. It's a desert there now. Literally sand, but it's also a spiritual desert. And if you go there at five o'clock in the morning, you hear a terrible noise that hits you in the belly, or did me anyway, and it spoils your day. The most miserable sound you ever hear in your life, that prayer call for Islam. But once the gospel was there, but they obviously degenerated and turned away from the gospel and Christ took away the candlestick. And something came in its place. Do you know what it was? It's called Islam. How much longer? The question is, though, for preachers, what does all this mean to us? Isn't it? I mean, preaching means applying the word of God. God, this is the God's word. It's not meant to be a historical study. Oh, that's nice. That's what they did in North Africa. That's what they did in Jerusalem. That's not the point of it. It's what does it mean for us? I mean, something, it does mean something for us, I'll tell you. The word of God is abiding. It's a living thing. God hasn't taken pains to record this and hold this together for thousands of years and bring it to us in English for nothing. Now, 
I'm going to ask a question. Well, I believe preachers should ask questions. But on this occasion, I don't know the answer. And that's genuine. I don't. I nearly always ask questions when I know what I think the, I know what the answer is. I'm asking for reason of instruction. It helps people to see when they answer questions. The question is this. Do you think that God is saying this to us today? Or that one of you would shut the doors? Of course you haven't heard a sermon. You've not heard a discourse on this. What preacher's going to say this? I'm asking a question, my friend. And I'm going to answer it myself. What is your answer to it? As you look around the circumstances of this time, as you weigh what's going on, as you keep your ears open and your eyes open, as you know what's going on, do you feel there's any possibility that God might be saying to us that he's just sick and fed up with what's going on in his name? And he wishes it would stop? I was reading just a day or two ago, I was reading something that Martin Lloyd-Jones was saying in the 40s and 50s and the 60s. He was coming around the country um, a fair bit in those days and preaching and he made an observation. I think it was in the 70s he actually made the observation. And he made the observation that in his view as he saw things, the Church of Jesus Christ was in a terribly degenerate and degenerating state. Things looked very bad to him. That was his opinion. I was also reading of a man in 1840 who was commenting on the churches that he saw here and in Germany as he was comparing them and he said he saw much carnality, feasting and pleasuring and all the rest of it in the name of Christ and he deplored it. That was in 1840. Well, I'll tell you, my friend, my observations. And they match that entirely. The church used to be a body separate from the world. When I was a young man, separation was one of the great words among us. We had to be separate from the world. You never hear it today. In fact, we want the walls down and we want the world in. And we'll offer them anything they want to get them here. I'm not making it up. Do you want names? Talk to me afterwards and I'll give you the names. Let's take them on powerboat rides around the uh, Isle of Wight. Let's take them on day trips and give them cream teas and give them everything. Get them in. Of course, we hope they're somehow coming under the gospel or something. But don't preach nasty stuff to them. Make it easy and gentle and so on and so on. I could go on and on about it. So what's my answer to the question? I don't know. Is it time? But every day that passes, I get nearer and nearer to the place where I'm going to say no for myself anyway. But this is not the point. This is not the real point here. The real point is that if we do not take steps, personally, individually, and in churches, if we don't take steps to rectify this matter, God may well take the matter into his own hands. That's the point of Malachi. That's the point of Revelation 2 and 3. Jesus says, repent or else I will come. And come he did. I don't mean in mercy. I mean in judgment. And it won't be a vacuum, my friend. Because you know very well what I'm saying now is happening in some parts of our country. You know very well that places like this are closing and they're opening the next day. But it's not Christ that's preacher, it's Islam. In the Reformation, Islam reached Vienna. It conquered Spain. It's lost its grip in Spain. It's lost its grip in Vienna and the, and the Balkans. In the main, although it's still there. But it's maintained its hold in Africa. But now Islam is in the country.
So however you answer the question, my friend, shove it under the carpet, push it aside, don't think about it. I'll tell you one person who is not shoving it under the carpet, and that is Jesus Christ. And it challenges me to do all I can in my time to maintain the truth of Christ and try and pro preach the gospel and in my own life to try and keep us clear of the world, to live in the world but not of it as much as I can. Just one more thought. This has been a word for believers this morning, a very severe word. I fully admit it, but I don't apologize. But my friend, if you're an unbeliever here, you haven't got off unscathed. Not at all. I don't need to enlarge on this, but listen to it. Please, listen to it. If you value your soul. Here is Peter writing his first letter. And he writes this in chapter 4. It's page 1220 in the Bible. You need to look it up. But it's 1220 in this Bible. It's 1 Peter chapter 4. And it's at verse 17. I'm just going to read it. Let the words come into your heart, unbeliever. And answer it for yourself, my friend. For it is time, says the apostle, for judgment to begin with the family, the house of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? It's been a severe word for every believer. But my friend, if you're an unbeliever, it's been a word of mercy to you, warning you to flee from the wrath to come before it is too late. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll be swept away in the deluge. These are solemn words, I know. But I believe that they are needed in our generation.